Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Andrew Sheng. He is currently the director of the Georgetown Institute of Open and Advanced Studies in Penang. He has formerly been very, very involved with INET through the Asian Global Institute, used to be called Fung Global Institute. So Andrew, uh, you've just done an extraordinary uh, presentation to our Young Scholars Initiative about the implications of the pandemic, how to see it, how it propagates. And uh, I guess I'd like to share with the, uh, the audience here today, what are your thoughts? What do you see happening? Where all around the world, what who's doing things well? Who's doing things poorly? Are we missing the whole picture? What do you, what do you suggest, and what do you see? Uh, thank you, Rob. It's a great honor to be on this. The COVID uh, has uh, well, we we still don't know when exactly it started, but it broke out in Wuhan, China, and within less than Today's uh, April the 20th, and it's already spread to more than, you know, uh, nearly two and a half million people, uh, 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 and, 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 and still spreading very, very rapidly. The, the, we've never seen anything that fast. Uh, whether it is that lethal or not, uh, you know, is being debated, but essentially, it's a great wake-up call for literally all the population of the world. Suddenly, everybody is vulnerable. The, 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 the virus, you know, uh, attacks everybody. Of course, the impact on the poor and the weak and those in poor states, uh, what I call the precariat, is going to be tremendous, uh, uh, very, very bad, devastating, okay? Because those who do not have access to good health, uh, good water, uh, good food, uh, um, you know, will will suffer most, you know, from this. But we have not had a, you know, globalization was never so impactful in the sense that every one of us were 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 hit and suddenly became aware of our own mortality, and. As, as much as half the world's population is in some form of lockdown. So the impact is a epidemic, not just on a medical term, but it is on emotional term. It is on a personal term. It is social, economic, and political. Now, you know, the last one is of course where all the blame game starts. Uh, and, you know, makes life even more complicated. But I think, you know, all of us who are humanitarians realize that, you know, uh, the, the lives comes first. Uh, economics is important, and livelihood is very important. And someone put it very, very well, it is not a choice between life or livelihood, but life and livelihood. But the... The, the, the economic impact now means that unemployment is now shooting up very, very rapidly, 22 million uh, in the United States alone. The International Labor Organization thought it was going to be as much as 25 million. It's 22 million in the United States alone. So the, the, the depth of the economic uh, depression is, is profound. Uh, some people's you know, compared it with the 2008 uh, financial crisis, global financial crisis, I say it's far, far worse. The reason is very straightforward. The 2008 financial crisis was a crisis of a financial sector that was highly over leveraged, but showed the similarity in terms of viral contagion with the rest of the world. But at that time, the real economy was reasonably healthy. Governments had fiscal and monetary space. And this time round, the rich country's debt-to-GDP ratio is nearly already 100% of GDP. 
And the Fed alone has increased its balance sheet by over two trillion uh, in a matter of a month. And if how much is two trillion? Well, world GDP is eighty-eight trillion, right? So you uh, you you have some clue of how big uh, this impact is, given 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 the numbers. I think who has done well, who has done badly. The answer is nobody. Even though we were warned, uh, and uh, um, in the Obama regime uh, period, uh, he already warned that one of the biggest risks is not war but pandemics. Uh, and there is a uh, in October last year, there was a global health security index that uh, indicated that we must be prepared for this. Uh, and you know clearly, uh, very the, the 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 top two countries that were supposed to be well prepared turn out to have the highest uh, amongst the highest mortality rates. Now, um, I think everybody made mistakes, and there are no winners, but all losers. It's only relative who who has you know suffered more. Let me uh, highlight. The, the ones that seem to be doing well. Uh, I, I, nothing is final. Uh, um, China, after blundering uh, for about a month or so, finally got its act together, implemented very uh, uh, draconian, uh, some people call it authoritarian, lockdown, and contained the, 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 the deaths, uh, the, the, the deaths to... Uh, the uh, uh, 50 million uh, province of Hubei and Wuhan, where it happened. And that's because they were able to test, trace, and contain, um, mainly using mobile phones. Uh, this was very rapidly adapted by the South Koreans, who were the first to, to uh, implement this. And they had a few clusters that they controlled very, very well. Uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, Taiwan also, Taiwan because it's an island, uh, adapt, adapted very well by shutdown very, very early from people coming in from the mainland. <clears throat> Hong Kong and Singapore did very well because they learned from the previous 203 SARS. <clears throat> uh, Japan initially looked very well, but I'm very worried because you know Japan um, uh, didn't react as fast on the lockdown. And today the numbers are already over 10,000. Uh, 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 so it's 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 a serious issue. Um, the 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 countries uh, in Europe uh, all were you know had very high standards of medicine, uh, and 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 tackled this very very differently. Italy and Spain were the two uh, are the two most badly hit, but in terms of numbers now, uh, uh, the United Kingdom and Germany. Uh, and Sweden's are over the ten thousand mark. Now, the 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 Swedish model is the most interesting one uh, because they basically did not practice lockdown, and uh, uh, it, it 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 suffers a thousand over deaths. Uh, 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 but you know the debate over this is is very very critical. I believe so far amongst the European countries. Uh, Germany has done the best. It has a high level of infection, but because it does test, 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 it's, 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 it has deaths, but the death rate is significantly lower than uh, Italy, Spain, uh, France, or, or the United Kingdom. So um, let, 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 let me, let me uh, give a, you know, uh, uh, an insight to where I you know, think COVID is has taught us. First, the, the amounts of cooperation, innovation at a global level, at a local level, uh, amongst professionals, scientists, uh, medical people, is just amazing. You know, one has to applaud the sacrifices, the heroism of, you know, uh, medical workers who go frontline and the people who are doing the uh, uh, medical support services, cleaning, essential services, 
fantastic. But unfortunately, I think the politicians uh, um, have, in my view, bungled everywhere, almost everywhere. Uh, you know, particularly those who did not listen to the prof- the uh, medical professionals. There is a there is a very interesting uh, 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 matter that has now brought up for as you know for economics, which is the use of modeling. I think now um, it's very clear that if you have got good data uh, and you have uh, fairly sophisticated models you can actually, you know, track and predict uh, um, the outbreak uh, of a viral um, uh, transmission uh, fairly well. And so COVID, from a, um, uh, from a um, economics theory and practice perspective, is, is, is in fact a uh, I wouldn't say a wake-up call, but it is a very profound moment, uh, very much like the uh, uh, Thirty Years' War, which then uh, triggered off the rationalist movement in Europe. Uh, uh, as we recall, the Thirty Years' War was a, a devastating, high death rate, high dev- um, devastation of the European economies. Uh, uh, and, and, and it, it coincided with the mini ice age, by the way, which then transformed the thinking of Europe towards science and technology. And, you know, some people claim that it sparked off the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I think COVID will do the same for us. Uh, it, 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 is a, it is a it is a very profound uh, wake up call, certainly for me. Uh, it compressed and clarified all my own uh, probably confused thinking as I shifted out of my previous very neoliberal free market own background in finance towards a complexity view of the world in which everything is entangled, uh, connected together, interdependent, uh, interactive, uh, and uh, reflexive. Uh, so that, you know, th- that to me uh, is the biggest uh, shakeup that uh, COVID has brought. It has brought the connection between individuals, the role of individuals in society, and how the uh, interaction uh, and connectivity between individuals and, 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 and society uh, interacts in extremely complex ways that cannot be explained linearly or mechanically. It can only be explained through um, through what I call a complexity uh, a network perspective. Uh, and it takes the, uh, if, if I may put it very simply, the lowest common denominator, the virus, uh, to illustrate that we are all connected we are all in, interdependent, and we have to work together to, to you know, in fact, deal with this. And the 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 the, the is is not just a static uh, perspective, but it is dynamic in the sense that, um, uh, 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 you know, change happens. Uh, uh, change happens through emergence. Uh, and it, it can either emerge chaotically. We have now, all of us now understand, you know, exponential growth, uh, how, you know, in, infection can, you know, uh, double, treble um, uh, in a matter of days. That part, mathematics has now become very clear. It's no longer linear algebra, right? It's not a straight line anymore. It's actually, a, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, logarithmic um, and exponential. And, um, uh, you know, that basic training in mathematics uh, at a personal level has changed uh, everything. And, of course, uh, COVID has accelerated the online economy um, uh, and, and, and is having profound effect on the old uh, uh, mass venues, such as football stadiums, cruise ships, uh, uh, big malls, 
uh, large crowd gatherings, etc. But we're still going through it. So I would be uh, uh, arrogant if I I know uh, what's going to come out of the end of this. But you know, it's it's a great time for reflection. It is a great time for us to rethink, uh, and it's a great time, particularly. And that was my message to the YSI, the Young Scholars Initiative, that the young who are going to inherit the uh, the world needs to imagine what our new new society, our new economy, uh, our new uh, individual uh, uh, responsibilities are to each other uh, in this post uh, COVID world. Yeah, what is the old uh... Saying attributed to Mark Twain, it ain't the things that you don't know that get you in trouble. It's the things you know for sure that just ain't so. And I think there's a propensity right now of many people who are, what you might call, aware of sounding convincing as an expert in a time when people are anxious, creates what you might call popularity or market share. But an awful lot of expertise is very, very shallow. And for precisely the reasons you've described, it's broken away from a paradigm that uh, relied on a mathematics or a logic that had very little to do with how things actually are interconnected. And uh, there are a lot of unknown unknowns out there right now. This is not an experience that's happened 140 times before and we have a bell curve. We are, uh, we're flying in the fog right now. So I think, I think your humility is laudable. And uh, I hope as I make my first 100 podcasts that other people rise to that uh, awareness just as you did. Uh, Andrew, do you, what do you see... I, I've watched your uh, discussion with YSI and how you see the what you might call the economic losses accumulating. How, how does this, what you might call, cascade through time? I, I remember your PowerPoint emphasized a great deal on uh, what you might call the difference between flows and stocks, the difference between the income statement of a company or a family or anything like that. And the, which might call deterioration of wealth and the depth of the duration of the crisis certainly uh, turn those flows into depleted stocks. But uh, describe for me how you see the economics unfolding and then the relationship between economic support on the one hand and obviously uh, the fighting of the disease on the other. Well, I think you know the the um, fighting of the disease. And I'm not a uh, specialist, uh, you know, in medicine uh, at all. Uh, I can only uh, surmise uh, or deduce from what the experts are saying. If the experts tell me that we are 12 to 18 months from a vaccine. And I can, I can say that we will only go back to some semblance of norm, normality. I mean, the, the, the old normal, some semblance. I'm not even saying that we're exactly there uh, when we find a vaccine because nobody is going to go out uh, uh, if they know that the, the, they have a, a, a random chance of getting infected. And that the, the medical impact on people who are of a certain age uh, is much, much higher, uh, and that there are a lot of people out there who are asymptomatic, which is uh, that they, they, they look perfectly healthy, they don't even have any symptoms, but they are carriers. So this issue uh, is we are looking out of probably a, a, a lockdown uh, 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 sorry, a major lockdown to to flatten the curve, right? Followed by periodic lockdowns uh, at, as when 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 clusters reappear in the system. So within the next two years, because you know, it, let's say we in, in, we find this in, in in twelve months, the vaccine it'll take us you know uh, 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 six months to roll out, and maybe another six months. 
before it gets out to the 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 the, the, the poorest countries. Put it this way: so everybody would have the, the chance of getting that vaccine. And as we all know, the vaccine does not necessarily work immediately because the 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 coronavirus is still evolving. Now that means that if we use the rule of thumb that OECD is using, which means that it it costs a loss of 2% of GDP per month uh, of lockdown, if we're talking out of a six-month lockdown, uh, you know, at the moment people are working on uh, what the IMF calculation is, that advanced countries will have 6% six, 6 GDP uh, decline, which works out at a, a three-month lockdown, which is, seems reasonable because that's what's happening right now. But if we, we extend that, you know, uh, um, to to let's say uh, 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 eight to ten percent, you know we're talking about very serious numbers, and 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 the flow in stock really you know uh, shows shows you that if you ha if you have some understanding of the balance sheets, what the uh, uh, the 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 neoliberal and the free market uh, uh, environment has taught us is that we have been blind to the precariousness of the median population. Uh, what, um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a phrase that's used here in Malaysia called B40, the bottom 40 people, but actually it's the B50 because the bottom half of society actually, you know, especially the bulge in the middle actually is living in what is now famously called the precariat. These are the people who have only somewhere between zero cash flow, zero spare cash, to at most a month of savings, and that the minute that they have a lockdown of a month, they immediately fall into debt and they may never recover. And even if they physically recover, they may come out to a job that no longer exists because the business that was there has gone. And what is the solution at the moment? The solution is that the, the central banks and the Ministry of Finance applied. They fought the last war. They took the lessons they learned from 2008, 2009, and started printing money and scattered uh, uh, helicopter money. And as you know, if the transmission me mechanism from the central bank to the masses is not perfect, uh, because they, the, the central banks don't understand the, uh, how to rifle shoot. That means you know, the transmission mechanism is very efficient. You give a, a dollar, it gets down to what the, the uh, little Abner said. You, know, you give a dollar, a dollar goes to the, 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 the poor. Instead, you give a dollar, only 10 cents gets to the poor. Then, you're, then, then, then that 90 cents goes somewhere else. Then you're in deep trouble. And that's exactly the situation where the helicopter money may not work. And even if the, the money temporarily stalls, stalls the, 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 the bleeding, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a cure. You know, I used to say uh, when, when it happened in the Asian financial crisis, and then I looked at the 2008 crisis, you can, you know, uh, liquidity from a central bank is like giving blood to a patient on the table. And uh, it, it stops the, it, you can stop the bleeding, you can give new blood, the guy survives, but does, has it cured the disease or the trauma or whatever, you know, caused the shock in the first place? And the answer is no. So we really need to go much deeper into what caused all this. And what caused all this is that uh, the, 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 the old paradigm uh, promised uh, 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 free markets, uh, uh, freedom to choose, uh, forgetting that actually, the, you know, it's 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 dual. There 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 is no free lunch. Uh, 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 you know, there are costs. Uh, uh, there there are second order, third order consequences. What do you see? The law of unintended consequences. Uh, what the law of unintended consequences means is the law in which. Uh, Something, it's Murphy's Law. Something happens where you weren't looking. The areas where you weren't looking. You know, what may happen actually happens. So essentially, we now really need to look, we cannot look at the world partially. 
we cannot say let's look only at GDP flows. We must look at the stocks because the stock flow is actually a substantive whole. But when but but when we look at the stock flow of an institution or a, or, or or a country, we realize the country is operating within the geopolitical system. The geopolitical system operates within a a planet. The planet operates within the universe, and we are interactively interconnected and interdependent on each other. So. Walter Jevons, uh, 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 one of the top English economists or the founders of the uh, uh, neoclassical school, uh, used to have, you know, say that the agricultural cycle was dependent upon sunspots. And he was using his observations then to, to do this. Today's, you know, uh, uh, quantitative economics would completely rule out the impact of uh, 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 sunspots on, on, on global aggregate demand as, or, you know, or su- supply. But actually, you've ruled out the, 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 the context of climate change. Our consumption affects uh, carbon emission. Our fossil-based consumption affects carbon emission. Carbon emission creates uh, 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 global warming. Global warming uh, has a major temperature change, then has you know, coral bleaching, uh, 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 you know, together with uh, uh, pollution, uh, 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 you know, bio, uh, the, the, the uh, destruction of biodiversity, then in, involves in evolution of uh, new viruses like uh, uh, coronavirus, which has then created the pandemics. So we're not seeing the end of the, you know, even if we were to 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 find the vaccine to 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 COVID nineteen, uh, there will still be more. Uh, pandemics to come. Which what does that mean? It means what Tolmin, this philosopher and his, his history of science, uh, Stephen Tolmin, uh, said about the uh, uh, postmodernism. When he looked at how the world became modern, he looked at the historical trend from a thirty years war that was so cruel, created rationalism. So Descartes, the French mathematician, suffered so much from the Thirty Years' War, he said, let's cut out the humanistic part of rationality and go for a mathematical, scientific, perfect world for which we can strive and hopefully eliminate these terrible emotions that that, that gets us. And of course, you know, the Descartes-Newtonian uh, uh, philosophy of science and the uh, worldview created the paradigm of science and technology. But Tumin basically also said that, you know, we've overdone this because, you know, once you rule out what is human, you actually see the world, you know, you know, half, half, like a blind man uh, feeling an elephant. You, 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 when you touch the, the, the part of the body, you say it's flat. When you touch the tail, you say it's round. You know, and you're only seeing parts of it. Whereas for a whole, we need to go back to before the, uh, the Enli- Enlightenment, in which philosophers dealt with the practical, dealt with the uh, uh, humanist part of things. And what does that mean is that we need to see the world in its total complexity. It's not just quantitative. It has to be qualitative. It has to. There has to be a narrative. It has to be adaptable. It has to be robust. It has to be immune. It has to be sustainable. And what the what the neoliberal uh, 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 paradigm of free markets, which was very attractive, it was a rejection of totalitarianism. You know, uh, after the Second World War, and you know, in when it started. It was wonderful because it started with uh, uh, FDR creating the New Deal, and the Depression, as you know, in the 1930s, was a combination of Dust Bowl, poverty, collapse of the banking system, the real depression, that then brought Keynesianism. It was no longer, while well, we do nothing, the market will take care of itself. You know, Keynesianism, New Deal, meant that the government needs to intervene. But the government over intervened. And so there was a reaction to Keynesianism in the 1970s. And there rose neoliberalism, particularly the Milton Free Chicago School, 
which married neoclassical, uh, let the market be free. The market would knows best. The market would take care of everything. And, you know, neoliberalism means, you know, in very crude terms, although it's much, much more sophisticated than that, that government is bad, market is good. And this simplistic philosophy sounds extremely attractive, but and, and the free markets, you know, uh, is also very good. But there was a small elite, well, a small number of people who understood that we can actually capture the system using this philosophy or ideology or mantra, and actually concentrate resources more and more into our hands. So if you really look at the United States as an example, because that's the best data, over the last 40 years, the, 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 the income and wealth was transferred from 90% of the population, 12% of total wealth of the United States and income was transferred from 90% of the population to the 10%. But actually, the 9%, the, 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 the 9% out of that 10% which are the professionals, the elites, you know, who are the intellectuals who, who, who are supposed to be the stewards of society, they did not serve the 90%. They assisted in the transfer of that 12% wealth to the 1%. And, and so, you know, the United States became extremely, you know, unequal. But that inequality actually happened across the world. If you really look at the global trend, the world itself you know, uh, 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 narrowed between the rich countries and the poor countries, but within each country, intra-inequality worsened. So then you look at the whole world as, uh, as, as, as a complete whole, what, does, what has happened is that if you think through it, how did we get into global warming? Well, my conclusion was global warming came from excess consumption. But if you have excess consumption, excess fossil fuel consumption, you get excess carbon emission, which then gets you know uh, climate warming. But how did what what permitted excess consumption? Answer the creation of excess debt. So if if as long as you are if you are if if uh, 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 if you are not able to 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 borrow, you will not be able to consume more than what is necessary. But as long as I'm able to create debt and there is a hard budget constraint in restraining debt, you will not be able to consume so much. But the, 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 the United States, uh, being uh, and in fact all reserve currency countries, have this huge advantage of being able to issue uh, debt uh, um, what appears to be in infinitely. But the, 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 now why couldn't you know, in the old days, the monetarists basically said, you can't do this. And you can't do this because it, if you, you can't do this in a closed society. But the minute the world opened up, in, it's in, since the 40 years ago, suddenly more than half of the world's population, previously under kind of some kind of state planning, uh, the China, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, India, Africa, Latin America, they all joined the global economy. So there was a huge, you know, labor shock, as well as a production sh uh, shock. You know, they produced so much goods in exchange for the dollar because they wanted dollar, they wanted euro, they wanted yen, they wanted pound sterling. And uh, so they, they, the global trade boomed. And, and if you then look at how global trade grew relative to uh, 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 global GDP, you suddenly found exactly like that exponential curve. It rose faster than global trade, rose faster than world GDP, and the poorer countries caught up with the richer countries. But in catching up the richer countries, the, the, the poor, the, the, the B4, B50, the bottom half of the, 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 the rich country uh, people started becoming poorer because jobs were exported out, 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 of, out of the rich countries to the poorer countries. So the result was there was huge un, in, inequitable redistribution in the system. And that really created this uh, whole transformation. So 
uh, as part of the uh, global commission, uh, the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, uh, uh, you know, I was trying to you know to understand all this, and I I I, I then realized that you know the reason for why we were blind to all the problems of post two thousand and eight was because we did not see it in complexity, systemic, and reflexive terms. And once you take that complexity perspective uh, 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 in which um, the, uh, the neoclassical copied their model from the Newtonian, Cartesian, Newtonian mathematics, but in 1905 to 1925, we move into a uh, physics terms and mathematical terms into quantitative, uh, sorry, uh, in quantum theory. And that changed the physics and the biology and the scientific uh, uh, paradigm, which the economics profession was slow to adapt. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, anywhere near understanding what's happening in quantum, but because I come from an Eastern background in which I studied uh, 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 Taoism and uh, uh, I Ching, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, and if you really look at the uh, Indian Dharma, uh, uh, Buddhist thinking, uh, all these are very close to uh, modern physics uh, 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 entanglement uh, ideas, in which nothing is perfect, everything is probabilistic, we live with uh, 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 uncertainty, uh, uh, and there is no perfect knowledge. And in fact, there are more and more unknown unknowns. So how do we now use this, this, this paradigm to start uh, looking at the things uh, that we're, we're dealing with? Firstly, I think uh, Stephen Toomey was absolutely right. We now need to be, you know, we can no longer look at mo static models of the world. We need to look at uh, not just about so-called rationality, and efficiency, we need to think about adaptability, uh, resilience, robustness, right, and uh, 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 sustainability, and and that comes from the understanding of the whole, uh, in what the Chinese call uh, 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 the the Chinese expression for entanglement is, uh, I am in you as you are in me. Whatever I do affects you, and whatever you do affects me, and that's very reflexive, and that's not a that you know shifts the the, the 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 perspectives of this world from an over narcissistic view of individualism towards the responsibilities of an individual in society and the minute the individual is in society the individual is not the society's master the individual is not the master of the planet even though we've got science we need to move out from a master-servant principal agent to a stewardship. We exist on this earth because we are stewards, you know, not the masters of our environment, of our society. And once we shift to that, we suddenly realize it's not about debt, which is about risk transfer. When I give money to you or in the form of a debt, you have to pay it back. I transfer my risks to you, you know, and, and, and if you, you can pay me back, I, I need to take your, your money and your collateral. And, and then if you, you know, can't pay me back, you work to me for life. And that's the meaning of the word bondage. Bondage was, came from the word slavery, you know, uh, uh, in which the, 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 the slave owner owns the slave. But today we are slaves to banking system in which, you know, we spend all our life you know, being bonded because we are told we can spend and we have, you know, we, we can have credit uh, anytime we want it. Whereas uh, 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 the, the risk uh, sharing stewardship is about equity. When I own equity in you, your loss is my loss. Your win is my win. We share. And therefore, the whole perspective of the steward is very different. You you shift your complete uh, worldview out of an individual to an individual within society and society within individuals, and that that changes the perspective. Now that perspective has a fantastic implication 
for the way the global supply chains, the distribution system, uh, 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 the way we uh, earn money uh, has been changed, right? I just wrote a piece of uh, a paper for, for um, a Project Syndicate uh, in which I asked myself, why is it, I, I'm not saying that the Chinese system is, 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 is good or bad. I'm just saying, why is it different? Why is it that the People's Bank of China uh, has not done the massive QE as the Fed during this period? Um, uh, 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 and the answer was that the Chinese banking system is a much more uh, less advanced than the American one, uh, and it's much more connected to the the mass population. So, le- for argument's sake, the the uh, 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 most people in China, seventy percent of the people in China, uh, uh, have bank accounts, but that's still not complete. What everybody in China has is a smartphone. So if you have a system in which the government transfer of the money, the subsidy, the, the, the aid can be transferred directly to your smartphone, your, you, know, you get the money straight away. Whereas, as you know, in, in the American system, the, the, the last few days, the Fed is printing all this money, providing all these programs, but it, 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 it can go to a bank account. Uh, but if you can't go to an ATM, you can't get the cash. And if it goes to a check, you the, the, the poor guy who doesn't have a bank account may have to discount that check at a substantive discount, maybe you know the uh, 10% off or or some people 20% off just to get the cash to, to to survive. So we really need to see how the different networks are connected to the masses and to ensure that the new supply chains are not the distribution chains, the supply chains. And the income chains are not broken when another pandemic or, or system occurs. Uh, you know, it changes completely. Uh, this is why this, this COVID is so uh, uh, powerful and profound, because it has forced us to completely rethink the way that we should uh, uh, reimagine the post-COVID COVID world. Can we make it better than the previous one? And can we make it more resilient than the previous one? Now, um, we look at the, what you might call all hands on deck, kind of war preparation sensibility that this pandemic has brought to the surface. But I also see, uh, you know, many people saying, well, it's darkest before dawn, things like that. But, and the, the way I'm replying to that right now is, yeah, and it might get darker before we see that light at the end of the tunnel. What I, what I find fascinating is, Andrew, you're, you're really underscoring and, and adding a great deal of insight to how the notion of ideas and the modes of thinking have, have just been scrambled. But I think there's another piece of this and I'll, I'll use the war preparation analogy, which was that after the Depression and the New Deal, government leaders, so we'll use Franklin Roosevelt as the uh, leading visionary, they looked like stewards. They looked like they were putting together a society in balance so that eight, nine years later, when the war preparation started, there had been a big boost in confidence and trust in the integrity of governance. I think in the aftermath of 2008, where, say, in the United States, we saw Occupy Wall Street on the left, we saw the Tea Party on the right, we saw the House, the Senate, and the presidency switch from Democratic to Republican control. My sense is that the faith the trust in the integrity of governance and expertise is in tatters. And I'm I'm curious how you think we restore, we resurrect the faith, first the integrity, and then the public's faith in expertise, particularly given such, you've used the word complex and reflexive, 
uh, phenomena that are so threatening to the health of mankind? Well, well, you see, um, that's why I went back uh, when I started uh, on this journey, and thanks that to you, uh, Rob, for giving me all these references, because I was a very, I, I, you know, I, I, I spent all my life in finance. I thought I understood finance. I worked in the freest of markets in Hong Kong, and I was a great believer in the neoliberal. And then, you know, uh, what happened was that, uh, um, you know, after being able to have an opportunity to work in China, and then, you know, go come back into the, um, the work in Malaysia, I kind of re, um, uh, uh, rediscovered that, the, you know, that the, we have, you know, quite a lot of blind spots. And I agree with the idea that, you know, uh, if you're an optimist, you think that we are darkest before dawn. But, you know, um, we, uh, uh, um, if, if you uh, think through uh, the quantum theory, uh, a, a quantum theory means that um, anything is possible. And uh, suddenly, uh, those of us who, who use the analogy black, black swans, uh, well, says, well, this is a one in 400 event, a 400 year event. Uh, and how come, you know, for the last three years, uh, uh, four or five of these one in 400 event, year events happen, creating, you know, one in uh, uh, 10,000 year event. Well, um, think about this you know we've been we have been fortunate that the internet has continued working uh during this uh, uh pandemic what happens if there was a cataclysmic uh, event uh, maybe due to a massive sunspot that wipes out all our internet at exactly the same time we would be sh in short term uh or you know or our electric power or a, a, a drought uh, somebody's already be pre predicting a possibility of another drought and in emerging markets because people cannot co uh, collect the food in the in the in the farms uh, we may be suffering you know a food drought so uh yes we you know uh, it, an, an optimist would say well it's dark but it could get darker uh and and we cannot rule all these issues out now you you can't you know uh, you know plan for uh, uh, all this but what it does take is this idea of stewardship. Now, when you said, you know, why is it that we have lost trust? Well, the reason why FDR uh, was such a great man, and people forget this, or a lot of people forgot this, was that he was a victim of polio, which is a viral thing. And because he suffered, he had a human suffering, he understood what it meant to suffer, the humiliation of people against polio victims, thinking, wow, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's this. And he was an extremely privileged person, as we know, but he suffered. And because he suffered, he did not go the normal way. He went out of his way to rethink the New Deal, the Marshall Plan, and, 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 and set forth, you know, truth and trust uh, and belief in the moral goodness of man. This, I think, you know, is, 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 is what has been fantastic, which is why, I, you know, I've suddenly realized that all good ideas, right, if carried to its extreme, can be abused by the few for their own gain because the masses, the 99% of the people, may not understood, have no clue uh, I, I'm, I, this is not uh, bias. This is because the information that they have been, been fed in the media, in, in education, you know, in everyday experience, did not understand uh, 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 some of the consequences. I asked myself, why, is, why was I, uh, uh, um, every day, uh, I cannot leave food on the table? The answer is I, I would not allow the food to go to waste. And the answer is when I grew up, I lived through rationing. My parents told me uh, the, they were refugees during the Second World War, that if you don't have enough food, remember tomorrow you may have no food. But we have lived in an age of plenty, as certainly for the, for the people who are wealthy enough. And, and, and so the experience level of many people of even today's generation of policymakers 
those people who have went to the elite schools, who, who have come from well-to-do families, who are now running the, the, the bureaucracies, the policymakers, they have forgotten how the people at the bottom live and struggle. Because the image always was, you are free to choose, and you, know, you, can, you, you, can, you can become the next billionaire. Uh, forgetting that the chances of a lot of people is that they, you know, the, the environment chooses for them, not they. They are in, in many ways, you know, helpless, you know, in dealing with these situations. What can a Syrian refugee be free to choose? Of course, he's free to run, but within the environment that he, he or she lives in, he is in a, a, a situation of total chaos. Uh, where, where there's no law and order, and 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 the, 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 they 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 don't know where the next food food is coming from, the water is coming from, even if they get sick, whether they will get to hospital to help, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we 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 have you know lo- there has been a growing disconnect. The growing disconnect is that you know the elite has forgotten their role as stewards, and think that you know they they write more rules they will solve problems. Whereas actually, it's not about writing laws. It's actually about going down to the grassroots to see whether the law, you know, actually is being enforced. You know, the law says everybody is equal. But actually, when you go down to the, the homeless, you know, the, 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 the poor, you know, are they being treated equally? Now, if those people on the top live in their own little cocoons, they, you know, in the French Revolution, you know, the, the somebody asked Mar- Marie Antoinette, you know, and then said, you know, uh, you know, let them have bread, not realizing the the, the people who stormed the Bastille didn't have bread. And today, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm being facetious. The idea is, why don't they take uh, tiramisu and order it on 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 online? And the answer is, they don't even have have computers, and they can't even op, you know, uh, buy 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 basic rice or or, or, or you know, or bread. So I think you know the 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 we have not realized to what extent in which there is now a misinformation war going on, in which uh, every day the uh, 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 different ideologies are now pumped out to the masses, and you know they are confused, and they don't know who to trust. And, 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 and when they, they are very angry, they lash out on each other, right? So, the, 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 you know, so we, we, we unfortunately, our generation of uh, leaders today, uh, you know, has, has lost a lot of the empathy that FDR had. And until they themselves begin to understand how, you know, uh, the problems of the poor the problems of the weak, the problems who are in the dark that you do not see are actually your problems or our problems. We share all this together. We will, our way of thinking cannot deal with, you know, the, the need for, you know, uh, as Gandhi said, we will always have what we need. We will never have enough for our greed. Um, uh, and and that, that, that is the, what, the, 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 the current uh, 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 paradigm has created inequalities and uh, abuses of the environment uh, in which, you know, of course, what, it's easy to blame the, the elite, the 1%, but all of us are responsible. And, and it's because the, the collective, the thought collective, uh, the, 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 the social thinking, which is our social capital, has been given a paradigm that is unsustainable. And it's our job, uh, uh, I certainly see this for, you know, whatever I can do, is to try and steer this back onto um, a a, a real connect with the people. I'm not a revolutionary. I just uh, feel that, you know, I I need some clarity uh, in my understanding of the world. Yeah, you you give a very uh, succinct statement of what, the diagnosis is and, and the remedies that, uh, that follow on. Let me uh, extend the discussion kind of to a, a realm 
that you've alluded to a couple of times in this conversation. But we were at a point where I would say belatedly, people were starting to recognize that we're on a relatively short time frame, given the scale of the transformation to address climate change. And the climate deterioration that James Hansen and others have been talking about just started to seemingly accelerate and move closer and the tangible evidence of climate deterioration and the, uh, what do I say, the symptoms of social disharmony and disruption that would accompany were, were emerging before our eyes. We've now had a pandemic and we've had to make very substantial uh, contributions of our fiscal capacities all around the world to address this disease. Some people feel that the exhaustion of fiscal capacity and the fatigue of the population, much of many of whom have been uh, displaced from their jobs in order to diminish the propagation of the disease. But many jobs are going to change structure in light of what's been induced in this coping. And, and so are these people going to say, we just can't do climate now. We got to stabilize things. And will we lose valuable time? Or alternatively, as the people who you might call optimists say, the paradigm that wasn't addressing climate change is in tatters and the pandemic has awakened us and now we can turn towards climate change and the collective action, collective responsibility and, and accelerate the transformation. And in essence, using the awakening of the pandemic to facilitate climate change and possibly using climate change transformation as the fiscal program or mission that's used to reinvigorate employment and, at, and in a profound transformation of the structure of the economy at a time when caution and deficient aggregate demand would be uh, the likely outcome absent such a mission. How do you see climate change and the energy to address it in light of what's unfolded. I'm, I'm an optimist about the climate change issue. Actually, uh, the, 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 in, in my view, the, the pandemic is a first-rate uh, uh, wake-up call uh, to, to everybody to say that the old model of economics and markets solving climate change is gone. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, we we wasted years because somebody said that you know, as long as we create a, uh, a carbon market, the carbon market uh, uh, would solve everything, and we solve nothing. And the reason why we solve nothing is because the carbon market may work in in Wall Street, but it doesn't work in the Amazon. It doesn't work in you know the the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you know, because ultimately that money that revolves around Wall Street trading carbon is not going to go down to the person who is going to deal with uh, 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 stopping, you know, uh, cutting down trees in the Amazon, uh, uh, stopping people polluting rivers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 the pandemic, uh, as you, if anyone who has watched uh, the satellite uh, uh, pictures of what's happening in Europe, uh, and in uh, 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 China, uh, including in, in India, over the uh, nitrogen oxide uh, uh, concentration, uh, carbon dioxide concentration, would see that actually the slowing down of human economic activity actually is, you know, is 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 slowing down carbon emission. Now it won't last forever. You know, we will we will we will, as as. As China begins to, re, re, you know, uh, revive economic activity again, and uh, 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 human, tr uh, you know, uh, travel uh, uh, restarts again, you know, the the, the we, we may go back to the old normal, which is very which which is going to be very sad. 
But think about this, okay? Um, and I want to use the Angkor Wat and the, uh, the, the, the Maya civilizations as examples. Human beings uh, 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 for, tend to, to forget what they did was good and what later on they did to glorify themselves was bad. The, 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 the Mayan civilization uh, started because they, they actually learned how to use uh, water properly. The, the Incan invented uh, irrigation, et cetera, et cetera, created agricultural uh, produce, and then started building pyramids. <clears throat> in, in, in Angkor, uh, they, 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 uh, you know, civilization grew based upon water irrigation, which increased food production. And then the, the, the elite started building uh, greater and greater temples, taller and taller pyramids, you know, and, 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 and then neglected the irrigation. The mosquitoes came back, uh, malaria came back, uh, uh, society became corrupt, and the civilization collapsed, just as in, in, in the Mayas. And this is exactly what we are doing as human beings. We are building higher, taller and taller, tall and steel and glass buildings, uh, temples that worship uh, money, the biggest, the tallest buildings in the world often are, you know, banks, uh, bank buildings. But what do they do for the masses other than creating jobs in building them in the first place? So why don't we use human energy to clean up the oceans, to clean up our rivers, to, to, to clean up the plastic, uh, to, to build new plants that actually are much more economically, uh, environmentally sustainable, to to make our cities green, to, uh, to, to actually use solar energy and replace, um, uh, replace the uh, fossil fuel-based uh, carbon, okay? I'm personally working on the idea that power is related to sunlight because ultimately, uh, if you really think through uh, where energy comes from in our planet, it actually, most of it comes into sunlight and sunlight is through photosynthesis become fossil fossil based uh, energy, which we learn to burn inefficiently, you know, to, to, to get back the energy. So actually, if we then think through it, because sunlight is free, uh, we can actually use that sun, uh, solar energy to, uh, to, you know, to power a lot of things that were going on and bec become much more uh, economical. But that's another conversation. What essentially what I meant is this, is that human beings are learned to use the cheap, what was thought to be cheap fossil-based power to power human consumption that is hugely damaging to uh, the environment, and at the same time, uh, devise mechanism which are hugely damaging to other human beings. I think we can rethink this game. I think the, the COVID-19 has forced us to rethink this game and rethink it out of the box. That means we need to change the paradigm. And I'm not smart enough to think, you know, uh, to outthink uh, this paradigm, but I'm trying to, you know, uh, uh, what I was trying to do in YSI was hopefully to, to spark some young minds who have not been uh, as embedded with the old paradigm to rethink the system so that we, we, we will be able to find our way out of this. I'm totally convinced that, you know, the days of individual polymaths are gone. That means, you know, the days of, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 Plato, uh, Aristotle, uh, uh, Confucius, uh, or Jesus Christ, or Muhammad, and, and, and all these, you know, are, are, are increasingly less important than the social capital, the, 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 the you know, the brain power of uh, many, many people. Uh, of course, there is very often one or two leaders or a few amongst them. If you look at those, all the scientific papers, some of them have 20, 30 names with them, you know, um, and, 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 and today, uh, you know, it, and some of these papers are really profound and very, very good. What does that tell you? It, it tells you that social intellectual capital may be the savior to our uh, uh, finding our new, our new paradigm. And, and that's where 
you know, maybe we will we will find this out of this, you know, Darwinian uh, con- con- contestation uh, from diversity. It's going to be a much more bottom up uh, uh, paradigm change uh, than a top down, you know, uh, having somebody like Hayek or or Keynes uh, trying to to do to describe what's going on. And I sense that uh, in the context of that bottom up. The question of globalization and global governance will come into under a great deal of scrutiny. Because on the one hand, what you see at the very uh, local level is people who are sensitive to the conditions of the citizens around them, but they don't have the power, given that the domain of the sovereign is much smaller than the scope of the market, they don't have the power to alleviate the maladies or or address things uh, credibly. And on the other side, you have global governance where everything is under one roof, but the distance from the people is it's a top-down type solution. And in recent years, that top-down type solution appears to have, uh, which you might call, been structured so that Financial capital and technology can have wings, whereas people are not as mobile as thinking of people now as a factor of production, though that's only part of their being. But the relative bargaining power shifted towards capital and technology and away from people slash labor during this preceding episode and the diseases of despair the geography of where they're located, the despairing voting, we might call it to leave in Brexit for Donald Trump, for Marie Le Pen, for the AFD and more, all correspond very closely. And so I think I think we're going to have to reconsider in light of the bottom-up imperative how to organize this planet and the which you might call unbridled, unrestricted free market notion that a traditional economist uh, was taught to believe in, to quote, free trade, has, how would I say, I think it's run into a, an awful lot of conflicts or, or contradictions that make it hard to understand where we go from here. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but I am not a uh, pessimist about globalization. Um, uh, what 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 is COVID nineteen? COVID nineteen is, is, is has become global, right? It it started local, and it spread around the world in uh, maybe less than ninety days. Um, uh, and, and 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 maybe within six months, you know, it, it will be a very large part of you know a global issue. And 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 look at what um, uh, somebody wrote uh, the other day. Uh, that we're dealing with two pandemics uh, uh, or epidemics. One is the uh, viral, and the other one is fear. But actually, what 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 he has described is is information is also viral, um, uh, and global information nowadays through the interconnection of the internet is now spreading very fast as a countervailing power to the pandemic. Uh, you know, never before have we seen the explosion of a spontaneous uh, research done by people from all over the place. I mean, you know, if you really think about it, uh, uh, in the old days, it may take three months uh, to six months to design a face mask, uh, 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 you know, and bring it out to market. Uh, today, with 3D printing uh, and a little bit of ingenuity, uh, you know, a, a little back, back, backyard shop is, is making face masks. Uh, you know, almost uh, within 24 hours. So to, in my view, uh, the, 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 the COVID, uh, the viral image of the COVID is actually an information viral. Um, uh, the, the, the information has become global. You almost cannot stop it, okay? Even though uh, there are people who try for political or for whatever means. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 then it, you know, started re- re- reflecting you know, I started reflecting on this, and I, I've just been reading a paper on what does truth in economics mean. Uh, and there's a wonderful paper by Frank Knight uh, on this subject. 
uh, the 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 I, I am not a, a totally uh, pessimistic over globalization. I think there will be a lot of fights, as human beings will uh, fight over different beliefs, different experiences. But the the viral nature of information that now spreads around the world, and the, the fact that sunlight is available everywhere, it means energy is everywhere. It's only a matter of the technology, how to harness that energy from sunlight rather than relying on fossil fuel, means that anybody anywhere, under any condition, if they actually help and through crowdfunding, we can help this. I mean, you know, can you imagine, you know, in a, in a, 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 a war veteran, you know, in the United in the United Kingdom, can walk around his uh, nearly hundred over years old, I think, you know, can walk around his house and raise twenty million pounds, okay, uh, in a matter of weeks, shows that crowdfunding is possible and people are generous. Uh, some of these ideas. So the, a lot of the ideas that you know somebody in the Amazon who has some access to the internet may be able to raise funds to to change their livelihood if they have some ideas that can help them. You know, and 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 can help the rest of society. Uh, you know, I, I am not uh, uh, um, totally pessimistic on what is happening. I realize that we will always human beings is always the struggle. You know, uh, uh, and a very uh, uh, complex uh, uh, interaction between the few and the masses, and the 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 you know I don't want to sound like a uh, you know Marxist or a socialist or whatever. All I'm just saying, we do need to take care of most of our people, uh, uh, um, and 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 we cannot have these uh, social injustices that we are increasingly uh, witnessing. So, and the reason is not because it is not good for individuals, uh, but because we have to think about the the complex whole. You know, so it's um uh, uh you know it is exactly you know my own work in progress uh, that I'm trying to you know the, the search for 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 what I believe must be the right way forward. All I know is that we there's no going back. Well, I'm uh, how would I say? I can feel you going forward. You're at the vanguard of new economic thinking. You're a dynamic impetus to the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, co-chaired by Mike Spence and Joe Stiglitz, both of whom greatly admire and appreciate your yearning and your search. As I listen to you, Andrew, I'm always reminded, and this is about the fifth or sixth time, of a verse in a song by Leonard Cohen. It's, the name of the song is Anthem, but the verse goes, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Our paradigm is broken. It's cracked. It's in tatters. That perfect offering was a mask. And I don't know anybody on this planet right now that sheds more light onto where we have to go than you do. And I want to thank you for being with me this evening and exploring these issues. And I hope to talk with you again in this forum before too much time passes. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Rob, for allowing me to share share this journey. I mean, uh, it's been a fantastic journey, uh, an exploration of fantastic minds that hopefully we will see some light at the end of the tunnel. You know, the enemy, the perfection cannot be the enemy of the good. And I think there is still a lot of good out there. And we, you know, we, 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 we should go and search and find the light. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to continuing to work with you as always. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.